The mysteries of the earth have captured the imagination of humankind since the dawn of civilization. Even today, with scientific and technological advancement, these questions of the unknown continue to challenge our perception of what we call reality. My name is George Popov. I'm a writer-director, and I've spent most of my life creating make-believe stories, trying to find the truth through telling lies, and continuing the same legacy of folklore and legends that have been passed down for thousands of years. But for some of those tales, truth and lies do not relate in such a simple equation. When the line between fact and fiction is enshrouded in mist and shadow, beyond that threshold is a place that can change our perspective on everything we think we know. I call this place the side world. Dominated by trees and the void of civilization, the great woodlands and forests of the world are the remnants of a time long forgotten. Whilst vast and majestic, these patches of land cultivate life and sustain the growth of an array of species. But what dark secrets do these forests hide when no human is around to witness? What lurks in the depths of the undergrowth, in the shadows of the trees? Wisman's Wood in Devon, England, is one of the three remote high-altitude oak woods on the Dartmoor National Park. Largely untouched by human interference, the forest has been left to its own devices, growing wild in a contorted prison of winding branches. The ground is formed of treacherous moss-covered boulders, creating many hazardous crevices for one to trip and fall. This tricky terrain is also the reason this forest has deterred wildlife from grazing here. Experts in forestry believe that at one time much of Dartmoor might have been covered in a very similar woodland to that of Wisman's Woods, but due to farming and hunting purposes, trees were cut down and repurposed over hundreds of years. This begs the question as to why this small patch of woodland had survived. Many historians and folklorists believe that the aura of mystery surrounding Wisman's Wood is the reason. For centuries, locals and writers have passed down mysterious sightings and eerie tales of druids, phantom monks, and ancient spirits, all connected to the woodland. In Dartmoor's trove of sightings, mythical tales, and old English folklore, one stands out as the most widely known most feared, the nightmarish Wisthounds. Mm -hmm. 
I was hiking along the edge of the moorland, coming up on Wistman's Wood. The plan was to set up camp and spend the night there. I'd heard all the fantastical stories and part of me was eager for a ghostly apparition to appear. The sun had set and I was losing light. I needed to pick a spot to pitch my tent quickly, cautious of the treacherous rocky terrain. I'd heard of many injuries there and the adders of course. A friend told me the ground would be crawling with them. I told him that was nonsense. As I edged into the decrepit woodlands, a low moaning sound settled on the wind. I tried to pinpoint it, and it seemed as if it was coming from the heart of the forest. As I stared into the web of branches, the moaning grew louder, and it suddenly dawned on me that it was the sound of dogs. The longer I stared, the louder and more defined it became. A pack of hounds, some yelping as if in pain, others howling. As I turned swiftly to leave the wood, the sound of a loud horn, like that of an old hunter, bellowed through the forest. There was complete silence. I peered once again into the forest, hoping to catch a glimpse of the one who had commanded the dogs to be silent. Then, just like before, a dull noise returned with the wind. But this time, it was growling. My heart sank as I began to see small dots of light coming into focus from the depths of the dark forest. They were the eyes of around 20 dogs, slowly creeping towards me, stalking, hunting. I was their prey. Well known in Devonshire folklore is the supposed existence of spectral dogs, otherworldly hounds that hunt and prey on lost travellers roaming the moors at night. To this day sightings of the creatures have been reported all across Dartmoor. Usually a wild dog is seen alone, sometimes in the fog or disappearing in the dense moorland, described as black, with fiery eyes and sprinkled all over with blood. Generally eyewitnesses report hearing the beast racing past them as if in hot pursuit of their prey. Others say their barks and growls echo across the moorland on stormy nights, with the sound impossible to pinpoint. It is common belief that spectral dogs in myths and folklore represent the souls of wicked humans, said to haunt the sides of rivers and ponds, their terrible howls said to make all who hear them lose their senses. Tales of the creature in Dartmoor over the years have directly inspired some of the great works of art in popular culture. Most notably Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's novel The Hound of the Baskervilles. Set out on the misty plains of Dartmoor, the story sees the iconic Sherlock Holmes investigating the attacks of the supernatural hound. The belief that malevolent spirits exist in roaming ravenous dogs is widely acknowledged across the world. But sightings of a pack of spectral dogs with a mysterious master, like that in Dartmoor, are less frequent. The Whist Hounds appear in Traditions, Superstitions and Folklore, 1856 by Charles Hardwick and earlier in The Tales of Cymru, 1848, by James Motley. Motley writes, Certain spots on Dartmoor are more commonly haunted by the Wishhounds than others. Several ancient roads are mentioned as the Abbot's Way and the Ridge Road. He furthers the lore by describing the fear of locals in the area, saying that it is not safe to leave the door of the house ajar for in this case they have the power of entering and have been known to devour sleeping children. Motley also goes on to mention the hound's elusive and ominous commander 
writing. They are guided by the master, a dark, gigantic figure carrying a long hunting pole at his back and with a horn slung across his neck. Rumor has it that the hound's black master is particularly fond of terrorizing lone travelers and unbaptized children. Some suggest the hounds themselves host the souls of the child victims claimed by the huntsman. In Yorkshire folklore, a spectral huntsman is mentioned by the great William Wordsworth. He oftentimes will start, for overhead are sweeping Gabriel's hounds, doomed with their impious lord the flying heart, the chase ever through aerial grounds. Dartmoor the legend of this dark huntsman is repeated in various forms throughout the centuries, with some differences in detail. Sometimes he rides a demonic skeleton horse, other times the horse is black, eyes as dark as coal. In one supposed instance in the 1600s, the rider accosted an inn full of locals and demanded cider to quench his thirst. A landlady claimed that when he drank, the cider hissed loudly in his throat, leading her to believe that he was in fact Satan himself. Could the Dark Huntsman be a demon? Or perhaps a murdered hunter, hellbent on the vengeance? The Huntsman is also connected to one of the most frightening tales associated with Dartmoor, the legend of the Wild Hunt. The Wild Hunt is a folkloric event that is rumored throughout the world in a variety of cultures. It sees a diabolical chase led by a mythological figure escorted by a ghostly or supernatural group of hunters passing in wild pursuit of their prey. Usually this is any man or beast foolish enough to cross its path. All hunts seem to share several common features wherever they appear. Most crucially a spectral leader and his baying pack of hounds, their eyes like glowing coals and breathing fire. The malevolent influence of the Dark Huntsman over Dartmoor is perhaps best summed up in an old folk tale that saw a farmer riding home across the moors, having been at Whitcomb Fair. After having a great deal to drink, the farmer had lost his way in the dead of night. Suddenly, a pack of spectral hounds flew past him, encouraged by their fiendish master. Drunk and belligerent, the men called out, asking for some of the huntsman's game. He halted his horse and turned back menacingly, launching a hessian sack into the farmer's hands. Take that, bellowed the huntsman's sinister voice before riding away. Taking the sack, the farmer hurried home, curious about what sort of game he had received. Upon arriving home, he discovered his wife completely inconsolable. It was at that moment the farmer glanced inside the sack. It was the corpse of his own baby. Dead and cold. Many other strange occurrences have said to grace the sacred ground of Wisman's Wood. It is thought to have been a meeting place for the ancient druids because of the many tolls and stone circles in the area. 
Ghostly sightings have also seen a group of monks dressed in red, walking in a procession-like manner through the forest. This is suspected to date back to the time when the forest was situated one of the many corpse roads or lichways across England. This was a path whereby remote communities would use to carry their dead when transporting them to a place of burial. However, of all the ominous and sinister presences said to exist in Wisman's woods, one is suspected to be its most ancient and most benevolent inhabitant. Known as the Spirit of Dartmoor, this mythological figure goes by the name of Old Crocker. Dartmoor has over 160 tours in its national park, dramatic granite outcrops that stand tall often on high ground, watching over the land like ancient protectors. Each tour has its own unique and distinct formation, formed over millions of years. Many have inspired Dartmoor folklore, their striking appearance firing the imagination of storytellers for centuries. Others have become places of worship, burial, and rituals. One of those nearest to Wisman's Wood is the Great Crockern Tor. Composed of two large rocks, Crockern Tor is a sacred place to many, said to be the home of the ancient god, Old Crockern. It is said that in certain angles the rock piles supposedly depict his profiled head and face. Legend has it that Old Crockern is a benevolent nature spirit, who in fact looks after the well-being of his land. However, an encounter with him is said to forebode bad luck, as he very rarely appears, and when he does, it is only to those intent on damaging his beloved Darkmoor. In Reverend Sabine Baring Gould's Book of the West, 1899, he recounts a rumored old tale of such an encounter. The tale goes that once there was a wealthy and innovative man from Manchester, who recently moved to Dartmoor after achieving great success through farming. After great plans on how to cultivate the land and make even more money, he ordered all of the machinery, seed and fertilizer that he would need, intent on showing the ignorant locals how useless they were, letting such land go to waste. One day he went for a walk to Crocken Tor, and gazed over the landscape. Here he met an old local man of the moor, who had lived in the area for all his life. The old man began to tell him of a peculiar dream he had the night before. In his dream, whilst hunting rabbits in Wisman's Wood, the wise old Crocken had appeared to him, skin as grey as granite with deep-set eyes as black and watery as peat pools. He had asked the man if he knew the stranger from Manchester, to which the old man replied that of course he knew of him. Old Crockern then said to give him a message. He said, Tell the man from Manchester that I know of his plans, and if he so much as scratches my back, I'll tear his pockets out. The farmer simply laughed at the old man and walked away. Over the following years the farmer would be beaten by the moors, for try as he might he faced problem after problem, sinking more money into his venture, until he was completely broke. Old Crockern had kept his promise. In some interpretations, the English word whist refers to being still and silent. However, the Devonshire word whist is far more sinister 
defined as pixelen, haunted, or a wish to invoke evil upon. Others see the word as a corruption of the Old Norse word, meaning the wise, most commonly associated with the god Odin. With all of its ancient reference, it's easy to read the forest name as the wise man's wood, referring to the druids of old, or perhaps its protector, Old Crocker. However, with the mention of Norse god Odin, echoes of the thunderous hooves and bellowing horns return with the wild hunt. In Germanic legends, Odin is said to lead the hunt. However, many interpretations see the leading huntsman as a number of characters, including Herod, Gabriel, the devil, or death himself. With such an array of depictions, there is no definitive leader of the hunt. But in Dartmoor folklore, when the Dark Hunt descends upon the moors, it is rumored that it's old Crocorn himself who leads the hunt. Depicted in some tales as riding a skeleton horse with his pack of hounds. Could old Crocorn and the Dark Huntsman in fact be one and the same? Are they both the Wistman of the Wood? In July 1836, a writer in the Quarterly Review wrote, The wild huntsman still lingers in Devonshire. The spectre pack which hunts over Dartmoor is called the Wishhounds. And the black master who follows the chase is no doubt the same who has left his mark on Wistman's Wood. With its roots in many of the legends across Dartmoor, Wistman's Woods has a strong foothold in the mysticism of the area. But could it be more than that? Could the forest in fact be an epicenter for all the supernatural occurrences that take place on Dartmoor, under the watchful eye of its arcane, forbidding protector. In the heart of Staffordshire stands an area of outstanding natural beauty, Cannock Chase. Known to locals as the Chase, the forest is one of England's finest landscapes, widely considered the jewel of the West Midlands. With picturesque scenery to spare, wildlife in abundance, and a rich and fascinating history, The forest is beloved by many for its tranquil and peaceful setting. However, dark secrets and an array of unexplained mysteries paint a very different picture. The chase is renowned in paranormal circles and considered one of the most supernatural forests in England. Described as the country's very own Skinwalker Ranch, many people believe the area is a hive of paranormal activity, with an abundance of alleged sightings of mysterious phenomena, from ghostly apparitions to mythical creatures.
Countless sightings of a black panther has led locals to believe that the wild cat has begun to breed on the chase. Reports have regularly sent police on the hunts for the animal. And although this has never led to definitive proof, woodland rangers have claimed to have found deer carcasses high up in trees, a common sign attributed to the big cat. Although this is certainly closer to being explainable, the otherworldly paranormal encounters on Canuck Chase take us further into the depths of the unknown. From vengeful apparitions to tales of werewolves and spectral apes, the one suspected creature remains the most discussed and most feared of all the Chase's supernatural inhabitants. An old local nursery rhyme told to the children of mining communities for over 70 years, sets the scene. When night falls, enter the woods at your peril. For inside lurks something worse than the devil. Avoid at all costs the gathering place, where at midnight the pig man roams on Canuck Chase. It was quite late and the chase was getting darker by the second. My cheap bike lights didn't help as I rode as fast as I could down the dirt tracks of the forest. I must have only been a half mile away from my cottage when I passed something, an animal of some sort. It scared the shit out of me but I was curious so I hit the brakes. I looked back around but saw nothing. Then I heard the squealing. Low and soft at first but gradually it grew louder. An overwhelming fear gripped my body. I turned and biked away as fast as I could, the piercing echoes of whatever it was behind me. When I eventually hit the first road in my village, the sound was long gone. I felt great relief and rolled on. Then I suddenly heard the loud snap of a stick. My heart was pounding, I'd spun around. Just beyond the reach of the dim streetlight was what looked like an extremely tall man in tattered human clothing. His head was deformed with what I can only describe as a snout for a nose, still panting like a wild beast. The squeals came and went with each heavy breath. Sightings of this beast have been surfacing since the Second World War, rumored as far back as the 1940s, a time when Canuck Chase was home to two huge military training camps and a prisoner of war camp for German and Austrian soldiers. Some locals believe that the British military created the Pigman nursery rhyme themselves and even spread rumors about the beast to keep civilians away from the POW camp. However, if this is true, then the many sightings in the years since the closure of the camps remain unexplained. Could the pigman be real? Roaming the forest in the cover of night? Feeding on the wildlife and stalking visitors? Or could the myth have spawned locals to honor the playful traditions of the nursery rhyme, reveling in the fear caused by the local legend? Another more bizarre origin story sees the pigman as a result of an illegal crossbreeding military science experiment, which took place in a secret laboratory under the shadow of the Pi Green telecommunication tower. The rabbit hole of theories runs deep, and among those nonsensical explanations, one old folktale may be the most convincing, taking us back to Canuck Chase in the 17th century.
the period is one of huge political and social unrest. A century that witnessed years of war, terror, and bloodshed that enveloped the kingdom. At this superstitious time, the fear of witchcraft loomed large over the land, resulting in many women being ostracized, tortured and killed for alleged alliances with the devil. A local legend tells the tale of a young pregnant woman, accosted and forced from her village after being accused of witchcraft. Outcast, she retreated into the woodland, where she would soon give birth, frightened and alone. Her painful cries consumed within the thick forest. The baby was born hideously deformed and knowing the surrounding communities would see her child as a sign of witchcraft, the young woman chose to abandon her own baby in the depths of Kanak Chase. She prayed that the woodland spirits would look fondly on her offspring and protect the child. The woman would eventually return to her village and fully repent for her evil ways, whether she was guilty or not. A few winters later, she fell victim to a fever, taking the devastating secret of her son's fate to the grave. It is rumored that around this time, sightings of a menacing beast began to spread fear throughout the community. Huge in stature and with hideous pig-like facial features, the creature was reported lurking on the outskirts of the village, watching the children play. The following year would see more sinister and mysterious incidents in the village, with several farm animals stolen from the dead of night and found the following day, half-eaten with their entrails ripped out. Soon after, children began to disappear, never to be seen again. With the incidents stacking up, and facing an immensely harsh winter, the village was eventually abandoned. Supposedly the remains of the 17th century village lie somewhere on Kanak Chase, long forgotten and buried under hundreds of years of vegetation. Could the deformed son of a suspected witch be the last remnant of this terrible time, cursed by the devil to live for centuries, trapped in his inhuman beast-like form? Or in reality, was the baby's disfigurement simply a cruel twist of fate, a result of the dire state of a burning England in the 1600s? In addition to the unexplained and otherworldly sightings on Kanak Chase, some are even rumored to be from another world entirely. Over the past century, the forest has seen a huge amount of UFO and even alien sightings. Most notably as recent as 2015, where hundreds of Kanak Chase residents reported strange lights in the sky above the forest. They described at first hearing a deep and very loud continuous droning noise followed by a sight of a triangular shaped craft with three red lights. Eyewitnesses initially suspected the craft to be an airplane about to crash. However, after the lights vanished, the deafening noise continued on for a further five minutes. Death is no stranger to this forest. In 1959, an agreement was made by English and German governments that all German nationals who lost their lives in the UK during the two world wars would be transferred from scattered burial grounds to a new cemetery established in the heart of Kanak Chase.
the cemetery contains almost 5,000 German and Austrian graves. These prisoners of war given the respect they deserve. And yet they remain in the place they were held against their will. The cemeteries on Canuck Chase are also suspected to be significant locations in terms of the supernatural activity. Considered by many as a potential hub for the paranormal, many strange sightings have taken place in the immediate area around the cemeteries, with even reports of apparitions and mysterious beasts lurking among the gravestones themselves. Could these be manifestations of energy accumulated over centuries of death? The notion of a life force being trapped in a location long after the body dies takes us to perhaps the darkest event in Canuck Chase's history, in a ghostly apparition known as the Black Eyed Child. Crying. It was a little girl crying, out in the cold, in the middle of the woods. I searched around, following the sound, but it was echoing all around me as if it was ricocheting off the trees. Then I saw her. She was maybe six or seven years old, with dark hair, facing away from me in the center of a long tunnel of trees. She was crying into her hands. I asked if she was alright, and quickly approached. I wondered how on earth she ended up out here all alone. I kneeled down beside her, noticing her dirt-covered dress. Still sobbing into her hands, she said, I can't see. I reached for her, but as my hand touched her arm, a deadly fear shot through me. The little girl removed her hands from her face. There were two gaping black pits where her eyes should have been. I leapt back in fear as she whispered again, Please, I can't see. In paranormal circles, the fairly recent phenomena of black-eyed children has been documented in alleged sightings all around the world. Encounters vary, but often the spirit is said to resemble a child with pale skin and black eyes, reportedly seen hitchhiking or begging. Some have been reported on the doorsteps of residential homes, asking to be let inside. The earliest officially recorded encounter was in Texas 1996. However, a spout of encounters with the black-eyed child on Canuck Chase, a rumor as far back as the early 1980s. Although these sinister sightings cast an ominous shadow on the woodland, it cowers in comparison to the devastating true crime that plagues the Chase's history. Going back to the 1960s and the terrible crimes of the monster of Canuck Chase. During the mid-1960s, two little girls from Staffordshire went missing. Diane Tift, age 5, vanished while playing with friends outside her home in September 1965. And just three months later, Margaret Reynolds, age 6, disappeared whilst walking to school in Aston. In January 1966, the bodies of the two little girls were found. 
together, buried in a ditch in the heart of Canuck Chase. They had been abused and strangled. Second, police stated that the girls had fallen prey to a monster. On August 19, 1967, another girl would go missing. Seven-year-old Christine Darby. Her disappearance sparked a countrywide search, with 24,000 flyers printed bearing Christine's photograph in the question, Were you in Canuck Chase last Saturday afternoon? By the early hours of August 20th, 300 police officers began to search the chase on foot, soon assisted by 200 officers from neighboring forces and a further 250 soldiers. On the 22nd, Christine Darby's body was discovered by a soldier searching a patch of plantation woodland. It was clear that she had fallen victim to the same sick killer as Diane and Margaret. Police mounted then the biggest manhunt in British police history, with 150 detectives visiting 39,000 homes and interviewing 80,000 people. But ultimately, the inquiries led to nothing. Over a year later, an attempted kidnapping in Walsall saw a little girl escaping from a motorist who tried to force her into its car. A courageous eyewitness who intervened took note of the car's registration. This soon led to the arrest of Raymond Leslie Morris at his factory workplace. When they searched his home, they found indecent photos of children. His identification in a lineup was combined with the fact that the car he once owned was the same color and make of that spotted on Canuck Chase around the time of Christine's murder. Raymond Morris was finally convicted of the murder of Christine Darby and is also considered the chief suspect in the deaths of Margaret Reynolds and Diana Joy Tift. It was later revealed that Morris had been interviewed over the killings four times by police, and that his own brother had reported that he believed Raymond was responsible for Diane and Margaret's disappearances back in 1965, a year before Christine was killed. However, as he had no evidence, his statement had been marked no further action. Due to a filing error, this information wasn't discovered until after Morris's trial. Right up until his death in 2014, Morris would continue to claim his innocence. The car Morris used to commit the murders was put up for sale following his conviction. In what one police investigator described as a bizarrely fitting gesture, a local businessman purchased the car solely in order that he could publicly burn it. The weight of the appalling tragedies looms large over the often picturesque woodland. Can an act so evil stain the land in some way? And are these sightings of the black-eyed child in any way linked to the little girls so cruelly taken before their time? Stone's throw away from London sits the Great Epping Forest. 
offering a return to nature for those looking to escape the hustle and bustle of the city. However, this forest is notorious for a number of reasons, one of which being its connection to criminal organizations from London who utilize the forest for illegal activity. The woodland has seen more than a dozen dead bodies discovered here since the 1960s, including victims of the infamous Cray Twins. But Epping Forest's violent past in fact dates back hundreds and even thousands of years, from rumored battlegrounds to vicious historical figures. With so much blood staining its soil, it's no surprise that Epping Forest is also considered by many as the most haunted forest in England. Over the years there has been a wide range of unearthly sightings and supernatural encounters. From malevolent folkloric apparitions stalking locals, to suspected victims of hideous crimes doomed to wander the wilderness for eternity. One common reported sighting sees a dark shadow in a tricorn hat stalking the woods at night. The specific attire has led many to believe that the spirit of a notorious highwayman haunts these woods. His name is Dick Turpin. This iconic figure has transcended the history books to become a legend with many incarnations. Romanticized as an anti-hero, Turpin has been presented in popular culture as a gallant and noble gentleman who died a courageous death. However, the harsh reality is that he was a contemptible, mean-spirited bandit working out of a cave in Epping Forest. Day to day he would brutally attack gamekeepers, shoot their dogs, and accost innocent passers-by for no good reason. In the Lawton incident of 1824, Turpin and the Essex gang bound a widow in her own home and brutally threatened her over a fire until she revealed where her money was. After a bounty was put on Turpin's head, he murdered the gamekeeper intent on capturing him. This, and a long list of crimes, would lead to Turpin being hanged in York in 1739. From criminal to executioner, another malevolent force is said to haunt the area that has come to be known as Hangman's Hill. Legend has it that centuries ago, a vile executioner who took great pleasure in his work went on a murderous rampage in the area. Rumor has it that he would bring his victims to the bottom of a hill in Epping Forest in the dead of night. He would tie a noose around their necks and proceed to drag them up the top of the hill. If their necks were not broken on the journey, he would remove their heads with an axe and bury them at the foot of a great oak tree. Many people still believe that the dark shadow of the hangman can be seen at night, pacing up and down the hill. Today the suspected location is one of a strange phenomenon, where cars appear to defy gravity and roll uphill whilst the engine is off. Many claim it to be an optical illusion due to the lay of the land, but others believe that it is the deadly force of the hangman still pulling his victims up to their deaths.
A number of other ghostly sightings in the area have placed an old horse-drawn carriage riding through the middle of a roundabout. A headless biker has also been spotted at the side of the road, and the screaming woman who rushes out in front of cars, staring the driver in the eyes before vanishing. Visitors have also spotted the spirit of a young woman dripping wet, wandering aimlessly through the forest. It is suspected that she drowned in one of the forest's many bodies of water. It is deep in the dark waters of these very pools where the most eerie and disturbing tale of Epping Forest can be found, the legend of the notorious Suicide Pond. The autumn colours were vibrant, although the day was bitter cold. The soft rays of sunlight provided much appreciated warmth, when the thick branches would allow it. We continued on, passing by a large pond of water. It was the third we had passed in less than an hour. Me and my wife were discussing the morning's newspaper headlines, when her contribution to the conversation began to peter out. She became uncharacteristically quiet, and it was clear that some unwelcome thought had clouded her mind be it one of sadness or anger, I couldn't tell. When I asked about it, she shrugged it off, as did I. We carried on a little further and I tried to return to our discussion, but after a few strides I realised that I was so suddenly alone. I glanced around, scouting the thick woodlands, the paths leading in a number of directions. Then my eyes halted on the closest shore of the pond. There was my wife standing on the edge, gazing down into the murky water, as if possessed by some sick fascination. I hurried over, but seeing her dull eyes fixed on the dark water sent a chill through my bones. She said softly, It knows me. It's calling. There have been many suicides in Epping Forest, however the pond in question supposedly has a malevolent desire for death. It is said to have the power to draw people closer when they're in the vicinity, and cloud their minds with impure thoughts of depression. It supposedly calls out to its victims, whispering, willing them to take their own life. A legend dates back to 300 years ago where a couple of young lovers would secretly meet at one of the many ponds in the forest. The place offered peace and tranquility, whilst being secluded enough for them to hide their love. It is easy to imagine the picturesque body of water and its surrounding trees reflecting the beauty of innocence and romance, but this would not last. One day, their passionate meeting was interrupted by a passerby. It was the girl's father. In a fit of rage and disgusted by her transgressions of the flesh, the man murdered his own daughter, beating her to death and dumping her lifeless body into the pond. Later, distraught with grief, the boy would go on to take his own life, drowning himself in the water. Soon after it said that the pond started to turn black, and wildlife mysteriously began to die around its edges. The legend ends, but the notorious pool has continued to earn its name, as more people would go on to take their own lives here. It is recorded that a woman committed suicide at the body of water in 1887, and soon after a young servant by the name of Emma Morgan, who took both her own and her child's life in the same location. Although, to this day, the exact pond remains a mystery. There are over a hundred lakes and ponds scattered across the area of Epping Forest, varying in size and age. The legendary suicide pond has never been officially identified. Befuddled and intrigued, people have longed to know the whereabouts of the specific location, daringly wanting to test the pond's supernatural quality.
Many have their own theories on which body of water it could be. One of the theories takes us to a prolific American British sculptor, Jacob Epstein, who died in 1959. Epstein had spent a lot of time in Epping Forest to escape the busy London life. He felt utterly enthralled by the popular romantic mythology surrounding the forest, with its prehistoric encampments, its history as a loyal Tudor hunting ground, and its haunt of illustrious highwaymen. In 1933 he began a series of landscape paintings that were highly unusual compared to the rest of his work. A couple of well-known pieces showed a small pond surrounded by trees. The pond was described as being incredibly hard to find, even with return trips. The current location remained a mystery for a number of years, until locals and experts studying Epstein's journals began to see similarities with the body of water known as Blackbeer Pond. Could this picturesque spot that inspired such art also be the killer pond? Experts say when studying Epstein's life, he was particularly traumatized in his later years by the tragic deaths of two of his children, Theodore and Esther Garman. Both died after suffering from long struggles with depression. Theodore by a panic and schizophrenia induced heart attack, and Esther soon after by suicide. Blackweir Pond is also situated a short walk from Loughton Camp, one of Epping Forest's two Iron Age hill forts. Along with the nearby Amblesbury Bank, these historical sites have fascinated archaeologists and visitors for years. They have also been regularly associated with the strange and paranormal instances that have taken place in the forest. It has been reported that to this day the haunting sound of battle drums can still be heard in the woodlands surrounding the camps. Others have seen three phantom women dressed in hooded robes walking along the road that runs between the forts at night. It is suspected that the three phantoms are actually the spirits of the warrior queen Boudicca and her daughters. It is rumored that Boudicca was based at the two hill forts in the final part of her life in 61 AD. Boudicca was the leader of the Iceni tribe of East Anglia, who rose up in defiance against the Roman Empire during their conquest of southern Britain. A hatred grew for the invading forces after a diplomatic meeting resulted in the warrior queen being publicly flogged and her daughters abused by Roman slaves. She would escape and go on to lead the tremendously successful retaliation, killing 70,000 Roman soldiers. But ultimately, it is thought that when faced with impending defeat, her demise would be by her own hand. Legend has it that Boudicca's last stand took place in Epping Forest. Surrounded and realizing that there was no hope of victory, Boudicca and her daughters took poison together, rather than risk falling into Roman hands once again. In a world commanded by reason, the location of Blackweir Pond must come down to coincidence. But if the legend is true, would Boudicca and her daughters not have visited the pond, the nearest patch of water to one of her suspected encampments? And does suicide seem uncharacteristic of the valiant force of nature that was the warrior queen Boudicca? Another body of water in the heart of Epping Forest is the Wake Valley Pond. Larger than the aforementioned Blackweir, this pond has been linked to an array of brutal murders, suspected suicides, and mysterious deaths as recent as the year 2020. 
with so many ponds hidden in the depths of Epping Forest. Would anyone ever be able to find a legendary suicide pond? And would they live to tell the tale once it has sunken its melancholy claws into their soul? Could it truly have been responsible for any or perhaps all of the countless people who have taken their own lives in this forest? For years, curiosity in the elusive pond has continued to grow, but no one had ever come forward publicly with knowledge of its existence, until 1959. A competition was held in the magazine Essex Countryside to find the exact whereabouts of the pond, and out of thousands of readers, one person wrote in, claiming to know its location, but refusing to reveal it to the world. She wrote, the suicide pool is deep in the heart of the forest, far from any road. It is dank, evil and malignant, with an atmosphere unpleasant beyond description. I doubt if the sunshine ever penetrates through the surrounding trees. If it did, it would never lighten the black waters. The woman's identity has never been revealed, and how she knew about the location was never explained. In her letter she also referenced the writer and expert in the paranormal, Elliot O'Donnell. In his book Haunted Breton 1948, he also claimed to have had first-hand experience of the suicide pond, writing. I have done several nocturnal vigils by the pool, and although I have visualized no ghosts, I more than once sensed a mixture of influences in the atmosphere and the near proximity of an earthly presence. Some very miserable, and others definitely evil. Are the resentful young lovers still angered by their unfairly short time together on this earth, now intent on causing the same pain and tragedy on others? Or did the legendary location transcend over time, romanticized by the tale of young love and the tragedy of innocence lost? Could this be the real reason that vulnerable people are lured in its dark waters? Malevolent or not, should we continue to hunt for the suicide pond? Or should its deep secrets be left in the dark? The sighting of a mythical creature in Epping Forest may cast a new light over the woodland. In Celtic mythology, a white deer is considered a messenger from another world. It is also said in Arthurian legend that the animal has an astonishing ability to evade capture, and that the pursuit of the animal represents mankind's spiritual quest. Much like our own quest to explain the unexplainable, to search for what is beyond our reach. Is it our unwavering belief that answers, even to the darkest questions, are worth seeking in order to enrich our understanding of the world? In chronicling the recorded and suspected horrors witnessed by these forests, it is clear that places of such life and growth undoubtedly welcome death into the safety of their shadows. A place removed from civilization is both pure and prime for corruption from those ready to abuse the forest gifts. Now after thousands of years, a simple stroll in the woods might take you along paths walked by the most evil of humans, passing trees rooted in blood-stained soil. 
but does this diminish its natural beauty? In the late 1830s, the poet John Clare was being treated at Dr. Matthew Allen's private asylum in Epping Forest for severe depression. He wrote letters to his wife saying how he was finding great therapy in the woodland. During his time here, he also wrote a number of poems, including A Walk in the Forest. I love the forest and its airy bounds, where friendly Campbell takes his daily rounds. I love the breakneck hills that headlong go and leave me high and half the world below. I love to see the beech hill mounting high, the brook without a bridge and nearly dry. There's Bucket Hill, a place of firs and clouds, which evening in a golden blaze enshrouds. <laughs> 